All right. Well, hello, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, thanks for joining us. And we are together um, uh, with Mark Mueller, Executive Director from the Outreach Foundation, uh, Vic Petrenko, uh, whose uh, wife, Amy, is uh, one of our trustees. I'm Tom Boone, Associate Director for Mission. And we have been back from Ukraine for the second time, uh, just a, a handful of weeks now, I think, right, guys? Mm -hmm. Uh, we've rolled out a few different uh, vlogs and a couple of reports, but thought it would be great to uh, get us together and just have a chat uh, about some of the things that we have experienced. What are some of the things that we're hearing on, on this side of the pond, having come back? And I think one question that maybe we can reflect on that I have heard several times is, well, what possessed you to go to Ukraine? Why did you go into a war zone? And um, uh, Mark, I don't know if I mean. That, yeah, I would say that's that true. Um, often do, that actually, seems to be pretty much our mo. Uh, working with the church, fueling the global mission of the work of Christ in areas that are sensitive, um, troubled, uh, in need of uh, our support, and showing up in those regions is is vital not only to our mission, but also to the people uh, over there. Uh, I think they feel a, a, a kindred spirit. They feel a, uh, um, uh, an immense amount of support when, when we show up. Yeah. I, I was reflecting with Rod Stone, pastor, uh, just north of here. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, he was, it started out very skittish about going. He wanted to go, but he was a little concerned, got anxious about it. He said a, a peace kind of came over him. Uh, how would you describe that, Vic? I know you're a, a retired general, so you've, this was probably not a big deal for you. But um, in terms of, gosh, I'm going into Ukraine. But uh, what are some of the, the thoughts going into a place like Ukraine uh, that, that maybe you had or you've heard from others <clears throat> i'd probably say it's quite a bit different because in the military you go in with a team uh you know mm -hmm. a lot of support and soldiers with you and you know and uh, it's a little different going in uh almost individually where mm -hmm. a small team like the three of us had uh you have no support you have no intel support you don't have logistics you don't have a lot of things but um some the kind of Mark uh, mentioned earlier, I mean, going in there for me was kind of personal because my family is Ukrainian. Yeah. And then after the war started there, I started realizing that, you know, a lot of the information on the different news channels um, were just reporting such diverse storylines that I was very curious about what was really going on in there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's twofold for me trying to find out um, what is are the Ukrainian people going through from a personal point of view, mm -hmm. and hearing the stories uh, from my family uh, escaping during w World War II and going through the famine in 32, mm -hmm. and what they went through uh, as a culture. And then, you know, personally, I was kind of curious about what's really going on down there. Uh, uh, is it, you know, full blown war, bombs dropping everywhere all over the country, 24 hours a day, every inch of uh, the land that they have? Um, so I was really curious about what the people are experiencing. And I guess the third part is I was really curious about how is God working in that area? How is God touching these folks? How are people turning to God or not? So that was the other aspect for me was trying to understand mm -hmm. that. That is how, how, how is God working in all this? Mm -hmm. is, is, is there the trust? Um, are they uh, upset? I mean, I just wasn't sure what to experience. So there's a lot of curiosity on my part. It, something you just mentioned, Vic, and we'll come back to a couple things, but one of the things that, that uh, you said, I know I was interested in gaining your, your, we were in different vans when we were driving <laughs> further east. But we drove through the area where your it was it your parents My or mom. your mom came yeah. from. What was yeah. that like for you to to go through all that? Well, other than it's uh, it was like wow, I'm I'm where my mom's from, and we were blowing through there fairly quickly, <laughs> but uh, both ways, going in and coming out. But it was just kind of an in interesting thought, you know, thoughts of your mom growing up as a child somewhere in a village around here, and we're driving through it now in the middle of a war. So it was just kind of sentimentally, it was, it, it was nice 
to think mm -hmm. about her at that point uh, since she passed away several years ago. Um, and to know that that's kind of generally the area that she grew up in. Uh, so that's kind of about all I had on that one. But as you know, we were driving very fast. We were driving 80 miles an hour at least. And it's a huge country. So Well, and that's what stuck with me, Vic, is I was reflecting on that famine of 32. And those folks did not have nice roads to get out. And that, that there wasn't anything like that. Um, trains would have been a, the best type of thing. But a lot of them actually went by foot and, right. and by mule. And... It's a long, I don't know, did you, Mark, if you all, if you were able to reflect on that, but how long of a border that is. Ukraine's the size of Texas. About right, it. right. Just, it's a, just little, a huge amount of territory. I think it's that. 90% of Texas by square mileage. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I as I was talking to the session when I got back, you know, driving from the Polish border to Kiev, we were probably driving 80 miles an hour on average. And that took us 10 hours. And then a couple days later, when we went from Kiev to Kharkiv and then down towards Bakhmut and Donetsk, again, you're, we're driving seven or eight hours. And on the eastern side, I think we're probably closer to 90 or 95 miles an hour yeah. in three vans. So it's a huge country. And I'm trying to put in perspective for people. I, I think it's, like you said, you know, 90% the size of Texas. It takes you two days to drive across Texas usually. I think it, you could put two North Carolinas together, east to west, mm -hmm. you know, and drive yeah. from the western part of that all the way yeah. uh, to yeah. the east. I mean, it, it's huge, and it's very deep, also. Mm -hmm. So, and they're having to defend all of that. There's... Oh, they, they have a tremendous territory to defend that border, mm -hmm. in which uh, the Russian forces are occupying and then also conducting operations in the east, northeast by Kharkiv and across the north, that's a tremendously long and extensive uh, border that they have to defend. And that doesn't, that doesn't take into account that if the Russians were to do some kind of asymmetric uh, operation, dropping in behind the lines mm, and cutting off okay. uh, border crossings in Poland or somewhere else, uh, it, it's it's a huge landmass to defend. Yeah. One of our um, one of our teammates, Tim Sherwood, when we were at the end of our time together, put I think it, uh, very well. He described our um, we have some folks going past here. Um, the we we had uh, he he described it as two fronts. Do you remember when he des he described that? said what what we're experiencing there are two fronts to this war and he's not talking about the military front as on the on one side you have uh the military chaplains and and then on the other front you have uh the church mm -hmm. and we got a chance to be with both of those that's really the why of our the purpose of our uh of our um our visit was uh to come alongside the church uh, to be with military chaplains, uh, to supply um, immediate first aid kits to soldiers, which was great to do, and we can reflect on that a bit. But, Mark, on, the, on that Far Eastern trip, uh, which was a bit of a surprise, we didn't know we were going to do that, we got a chance to see one of those two fronts in action, um, which is the, uh, the church. I know you've reflected on that a good bit. What? what well, I think certainly the re resiliency about about of that. the church and what how the church um, really goes about being the church in the different uh, environments that it's placed. Um, the church that we visited, um, for instance, uh, had been bombed. The congregation members were uh, congregation members of a church that had been destroyed by Russian artillery. And so they retreated, obviously, uh, but what they did is they remained the church by locating in a community not far from where their church was destroyed. Uh, it was a house, um, probably several houses that, that functioned as the church. And it was just incredible to see the church at work. Here you saw uh, a place where the garage was filled with food supplies that were being collected for not only the church members, but the whole community. 
you saw tables full of clothes that could, that were being shared with everybody that was in need. You you saw a pastor, the pastor of the church, um, conducting a new members class, packed 25 people, learning or seeking um, some kind of message of hope amidst all of this chaos. You saw kids playing on a playground or, you know, on a makeshift slide. Uh, and then while we were there, uh, after we were, again, welcomed with tea and cookies, yeah. you know, just like any place here in the United States, perhaps, uh, you saw the church uh, assemble a, a huge white tent. And then they put benches there. And we, at, I don't know, two o'clock in the afternoon on a one day of the week, I can't remember the day of the week that we were there, um, had a worship service where four of us spoke to a packed house, 250 people. You had people standing in the back. And so the word was proclaimed, the, the word was sung, there were prayers. And then at the end of the service, the, the, the people in the, the pews stood up and they said, okay, uh, who's, got, who's got eggs or who has meat or who has poultry, whatever, uh, to share? And you saw the church coming together in the most difficult of circumstances and it didn't blink. So to think that our churches, you know, again, we have great churches in the United States, they have tremendous facilities, but if they were destroyed, what would the church do? And there in Ukraine, you see a living example of the way I think God wants the church um, to be in the circumstances of the context in which it's found. So we supported that effort and continue to support that effort. And it was just a phenomenal experience just that day, that little time all by itself. And I think when you travel, at least my experience is, you have hundreds of those experiences. Um, and it's and it's when you get back, you kind of process through those. And so being on this trip with both of you um, and the rest of the team, you, you begin to share some of those experiences and they really do inform you. You go back changed in so many aspects. It's interesting how the church has become the hub though. We saw that on our first yeah. trip mm -hmm. a year ago yeah. Yeah. where the seminary and the church is the hub for not only the church members, but the community. Mm -hmm. And they're providing meals and just support. Okay. And the Bibles are flying off the, you know, the, the book racks. Um, and same thing on um, that one village we went to, right? The, I was standing in the back of that little fest tent. And it started getting so busy that I stepped out just to give room for the older folks coming in trying to sit down at a little bench and i remember looking at the ground it's pretty muddy it's muddy in there it's kind of soggy right. it was it was soggy uh, the wind was blowing the the tents kind of flapping around so i kind of stood i stood in the back and i stepped out finally just to give people more room and then i wandered around that facility i, I wandered around where that church was located and then i i came across um Russian positions where they had put their artillery mm -hmm. and mortars and they had dug them in to what we call hold defilade in between the homes. So in between Ukrainian homes or Russian positions and that you still had the ammunition boxes that they used to fire okay. on the Ukrainians um, near Kharkiv and all that. And so it was just, it was fascinating to hear the praise, the worship going on out of this tent seeing the church that you talked about in a, in a converted home, right, with the piles of clothes on the tables outside, um, and then to realize uh, the war had been executed in this spot with, you know, yeah. old Russian positions yeah. Yeah. and ammunition boxes. It, it, it was just very interesting. Well, and, and that's the kind of situation where the church, and when it is in places of war, I've, you know, in Syria and some places that, that I know in Iraq where we've been too, um, and some places in Africa, 
the church finds itself in these compromised areas. And you, but what's wonderful is see the church doesn't wait for things to be just ideal. Uh, it, it doesn't wait for it all to be cleaned up. It says, hey, this is where we're supposed to serve. Let's plant ourselves and see what God will do with it. And God is blessing that work. Um, guys, we were there last year, the three of us. Um, one of the questions that I have been asked a couple of times is, was there any difference between the people uh, and life last year versus this year. Um, people have been assuming that it's so much better now. The war is on, on the waning side. It's, it's, it's declining. Uh, there's not so much uh, going on. In fact, I heard that from a news reporter who was very surprised that, that, the, that the whole country was still embroiled in a war that, that she thought was just pretty much isolated in a couple spots now. Um, what are some of the differences that you all may have picked up? I, I experienced the same thing flying to Atlanta to catch the flight uh, with you. I was talking to a woman uh, next to me, and she basically communicated the same thing, that I thought the war was kind of over with over there. I, I don't see much on the news kind of thing. So she was kind of surprised we were going over there to help and mm -hmm. that the war was still ongoing. I, I think I was a little bit more relaxed this time than I was the first time. It's probably because yeah. we knew what to expect. We were familiar yeah. with the uh, the surroundings a little bit. We we knew what to expect out of the uh, air raid sirens that go off all day long. Um, my impression of the people we had met the year before was they're more tired. Mm -hmm. They were they look a little bit more worn in their faces. Um, some of the people had gained, I would say gained weight, not from eating really well, but I think it's just from stress. Just, they weren't in shape, yeah. the same kind of shape. I noticed that too, Mark, They're, if that's something you noticed, there's, there was I mean, several people that we met the year before who right. gained some weight. Right. And, um, I think there was just, uh, a, a wear and tear look yeah. on their faces and their bodies. I agree. I still think they're resilient. I think they're there to defend their country, but you can see the the toll that this war has taken on them because it's both physical and psychological. Mm -hmm. And after two yeah, years that was my of sense it, they're uh, they're tired. Faces, I think they're I uh, ready to have this end and get back to uh, some life of whatever that is going to look like. But they they are not given up. Yeah. Um, they know that if this war goes the wrong way, that their way of life, who they are, um, uh, from an ethnic standpoint, will cease to exist. Yeah. One of the women that we met, I think, was interesting. We saw her last year, and I know, Vic, you were looking for the same. Lucia yeah. um, gave the, the uh, Molly Pitcher medal, um, and that was great. So glad you did it. Um, reflect on that just briefly with us. I think that, that young woman, uh, Lucia, when we saw her a year ago, uh, her house was pretty much destroyed. That whole town mm -hmm. was destroyed. Yeah. She had gone through some really bad um, experiences the first days of the war when the Russians came through. And, um, but she was, her heart was so, um, um, it was a heart of just being a helper. She was yeah. helping the community rebuild. She was helping to make meals for the soldiers that were guarding uh, the airfield. And she had a, you know, I don't give up attitude. Uh, when I came home and I told my wife about it, I told Amy about her her and what we learned about her. And she goes, man, that, that young woman deserves a medal. You should give her a medal. So that's why we came up with the Molly Pitcher, because the Molly Pitcher, the essence of it is a woman uh, helping her husband in battle and taking his place on the battlefield when he falls. And that's kind of what I saw in her. That was mm -hmm. her spirit, that she's not, she's not giving up. I mean, she's vivacious, oh, yeah. you know, um, just all positive, all positive energy coming off of her. And she was so proud. I think the fact that she was able to show her, her home was actually fixed up. You know, yeah. we, we got a full meal. I think know about, that was amazing. So they don't have much there, but she, knowing that we're showing up, yeah. we had, we all had borscht and, uh, Perohe 
Piddle Head. And that was really good. And it was all wonderful <laughs> food that she <laughs> really prepared. She didn't need to. No. And I don't think she had, you know, the resources to do a lot of that. You know, she could have fed her family for two mm. weeks with all that. But um, I think that award to me, I mean, I just wanted to give her something. And what, what do you mm -hmm. give her for being a woman that is so strong, uh, yeah. is uh, not willing to give up, is willing to help the community, um, and finally to see her house fixed and have a kitchen and prepare a meal for us, oh, that right. was pretty special. That but was. I could see she was tired. She, she was had tired. changed. Yeah. And I don't, you know, she, you could see the stress on her face too. Yeah, and that was just one of the many, I and mean, we had so many <laughs> folks um, that just of these individuals that you know, we went over to convey some points about resilience, but we saw so much resilience. Uh, they instructed us, as is always the case. Um, so we met some soldiers, uh, at, and we won't disclose where we met those soldiers, but they were fresh, fresh from the front. We haven't really talked about that in any of our... Uh, communication yet. Um, so, so Vic, you're a former soldier. What was that like to be with those 30 some guys uh, fresh from the well, front? Well, guys and gals. And it gals. Was there some, was yeah, a combat a, medic. Combat medic, yeah. yeah. Um, you could tell by their, again, by their face, they were exhausted. They had the thousand yard stare. Some were pretty dirty and they just you can t you can just tell they're exhausted and just worn worn out, and uh, to the point where you start worrying about them. The one guy we we sat next to at the table trying yeah. to have a meal with him, he was very yeah he jittery and he couldn't you know, keep couldn't, his face yeah, straight, couldn't yeah. keep uh, focused. Yeah, um, but it was special to talk to them because that was the point where we just kind of came up to them who we were, why we were there. We gave them the neck gaiters, yes. which I thought was interesting. A lot of them started, you know, they had departed and came back wearing the neck they gaiters, which was kind of special. But a couple of those soldiers came up to me afterwards and said, we so much appreciate the fact that you appreciate us and that we, that you said that we are special. And they don't hear that mm. in Ukraine mm -hmm. right now. They're the soldiers fighting. Yeah. And everybody's fighting in Ukraine in their own way. But I think... Right now, there's um, there's a distancing between those that are on the front really fighting the war and people back in the city is trying to go back to normalcy. And um, the soldiers felt like there was, you know, it's like, man, nobody told me I was special. Because I told them, you're fighting for your nation. Yeah. You're the most honorable of citizens in your country. And they're like, nobody's ever told me that. Wow. And that's what we, I mean, we tell our soldiers they're special. They're defending the United States of America. They go to war for us. They yeah. die for this country. They die for our freedoms, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't want people to forget that. No. But I don't think they're quite doing that in Ukraine yet because everybody's in the fight. Yeah, they're all in it. Everybody's in the fight. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that a couple of soldiers came up to me and said, wow, you know, that it just, it was something special for you to say that we're special, that yeah. you're, you know, you're just special people for defending your own country. That kind of took me, took me by surprise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we went over well, there. And I'm sorry, sorry, but the other part was, as we're talking to him, um, I forget what I said in that environment because it was just, you're talking to soldiers, so you kind of get used to saying stuff to them. And um, But to watch their eyes glaze over with tears is kind of hard for me. Yeah. Because a couple of times when I was speaking about certain things and you're watching whatever I'm talking about make make a point with them and you, you could literally, you could see their their eyes tearing up. And then uh, there was a little bit of emotion came out when that one female medic came out and said, when we asked them, what do you need help with? We don't know what we don't know. I mean, we're bringing IFAX. We're bringing neck gaiters. We're here to hear your stories. But what else do you need? That's when that one female medic stood up and said, we need litters. We're running out of litters to transport our wounded and our yeah. dead. Yeah. So that was a takeaway. And then, you know, it's like, well, tell me more. And we started talking about um, the evacuation distances and the hospital positioning. But what got me enraged is... 
she said, well, what's even worse than not having litters is the fact that when we evacuate our wounded in ambulances to the hospitals in the rear, the Russian drones are taking out the ambulances. Yeah. So that, and then you could see the mood of the whole room. <coughs> that was not something she was making up. Because yeah. as soon as she said that, you could see a lot of eyes tear up and you could see you could see the emotions and all those soldiers sitting in that yeah. that hall at least that's what i picked up yeah. standing up there talking to them and then that was one point in which i became kind of enraged by hearing that because there is a, a law of warfare and that's something you don't do you don't take out ambulances and to hear that that's going on mm -hmm. really was really really uh, hard to hear yeah, there were a lot of things that we heard that really just maybe didn't surprise us, but hiss, I think, in different ways about about the war and how how truly atrocious it is. Um, we we one of the things that we really went to do was to be among chaplains, and that was a special time. Um, and you know, these are not necessarily pastors; some some of them were. Uh, who who said this is how I'm going to help? But some were volunteers. You know, several had, were not involved in ministry before, and were now had become chaplains and didn't have a whole lot of training. Um, one of the things that was really interesting, and I don't know if you all picked up on it, but they have a sense of what their role is, and it was so really it was it was good to get in there and bring people like you uh larry tony who is a retired military chaplain rod who is a chaplain to police uh north carolina um and, tim. and then tim who's a retired special forces colonel and say well let's let me tell you how it is really to have what is the real value of a chaplain yeah i think um, um <clears throat> one thing that everybody over that there seems experience. to be dealing with and it's quite natural would be ptsd um, and I'm, I think it's very prevalent in the United States as well, but it's very prevalent there. And to have some of the experts that we had on this trip um, that are trained in that um, and to give out ways to help um, was really a, a key takeaway I, for me mm -hmm. to see them value that and uh, and then I remember Vic saying, you know, it would be good to address that with soldiers before all of this happens, you know, as a part of training to begin to recognize the need that, um, that well, that would benefit everybody if, if we kind of practiced what, you know, some of the basic principles of PTSD and its talk, talk, talk. It's not rocket science, but that's what needs to take place. So that was a, always a key. And I think providing the chaplains, uh, the Ukrainian uh, chaplains, uh, some training in that um, was extremely important. Yeah, I was surprised that they didn't really have that training. Um, you know, they, they, they see their roles really as pastors of churches and and their pastors for the troops who are a part of their own right. tradition um and they pray with soldiers or they'll bring communion but they don't see themselves as combat multipliers as you right. said and i think it was very that was a big takeaway for me was uh, they sensed a larger purpose to their role not to minimize the role of prayer and communion and serving your folks but but that they they have a sense in which well okay I can help these soldiers fulfill their mission in in a way that I had not thought of before so I think that was a valuable thing and Yvonne Dr Rusin does want us to come back and and bring in. one of the things that we're going to be looking for um, in a future team are people who are trained in this kind of work uh, that we can bring over and and serve uh, the chaplain so that they can go out and and serve their people on, on the on the ground so it was a very worthwhile thing guys I, I just really really appreciate that you're willing to go for a second time. Um, we It was great the first time, uh, and the second time we had a, a different team, and so it changes the dynamics. But it, it was just, there's a sense of camaraderie 
that that I wish I could communicate that happens on an experience like this um, that that I know that we would love for others to experience uh, with us. Um, but no, thanks for being on this visit. Vic, thanks for bringing your experience. And, and Mark, of course, you're the executive director. So anytime you're on a visit, it's a privilege to have you uh, come. And I know that uh, the Ukrainians appreciated having having you uh, there. And then Vic, as a retired general, they, they all perked up when, I mean, they, 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 they got quiet when you talked. <laughs> so, you know, soldiers are soldiers, but yeah. uh, part of it is, I don't think we realize that their war in a way is kind of a come as you are war, like we did for a revolution in war, rev, uh, the revolution where units were formed in a small town. You kind of brought what you you had, mm -hmm. and it, I realized that a lot of chaplains don't even have army vehicles; they're using their own vehicles to get around and do their yeah. stuff on the battlefield. Yeah. So, you know, they're very appreciative of all the equipment coming in, but there are certain critical functions that go on on that battlefield where I realize that people are just using their own privately owned vehicles to get the job done. Yeah. And when that vehicle breaks down, they're paying out of pocket or trying to find right. a part to fix their car. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, the United States Army, we're very fortunate, are the support of our country and our uh, Congress and everybody about, you know, outfitting us. You know, they'll train us, they'll equip us, they'll man us. And they're not quite there. So no. they, they have to, in a way, kind of bring their own stuff to the fight. Some some people do. And just kind of reminds me of where we probably were as a, as a young country during the Revolutionary War and some of the units that came to play during our um, Civil War, where they came and brought what they had. And that's certainly one of the stories that came out of our visit, just the extent to the sacrifice that people are making to their own, um, you know, using their own vehicles and sacrificing so much uh, that there's a lot, what, there's many ways we can respond and we'll continue to do so. Um, guys, thanks a lot. And thank you all for listening. Just please know uh, that uh, God is very much at work in Ukraine. Uh, it's my feeling after this visit, even more so now, that this war has has provided an opportunity for the church for the Protestant Evangelical Church, which 30 years ago was marginalized as a cult, uh, now to be really at the lead edge of a transformation in the heart of Ukraine among Ukrainians. And it's happening before our eyes. And if we can pull our eyes off of the, 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 what, what the evil one wants us to see, and w uh, which is just destruction and useless uh, waste of resources, the fact that we're standing next to the church and alongside men and women like uh, Yvonne and Luda Rusin and their friends uh, is act is having an impact. It is transforming the culture and the heart of Ukrainians, and and it's a wonderful thing to see. And I I can't wait to see the future of Ukraine. And so pleased that the Outreach Foundation has decided to stay with this for the long haul. So thanks, guys, for being here. Thank you all for listening, and uh, we'll see you again. God bless.